קבלו בבקשה את קרן אלעזרי. תודה רבה, רן. תודה רבה. So I'll, I'll speak today in English uh, in honor of our uh, guests from abroad and those students uh, on international programs. My name is Karen Elazari, and I'd like to speak to you today about the next frontiers of hacking. I'm a hacker myself, and hackers are my source of inspiration. What I'd like to do today, very briefly, is bring you into my world, into the hacker's world, I'd like to show you why I think hackers are breaking the new frontiers, they're creating new technologies, and what we can all learn from them. So, if I'm being completely honest, I started uh, my, my life as a hacker, but... Oh, I see this clicker is not working. Hold on. Okay, that's better. So, I started out as a hacker, but as you know, people are not born hackers. They are made hackers. And the reality is, 20 years ago, I didn't really look like this. I looked more like this. This is a picture of me um, sometime during middle school. It will be very hard for you guys to find me in this picture because I was so much of a nerd, I was so much of a geek that I'm the one who looks like a boy all the way up there. Yeah, and I wouldn't go anywhere without my Walkman, which was kind of like my technological shield against the people that would make fun of me for being a geek. In fact, I was such a nerd that even the boys who had the Dungeons and Dragons group didn't let me join. <laughs> It's true. True story, really. But I had a hero. I had a source of inspiration. And this was my hero. You might know her as the Hollywood actress Angelina Jolie. For me, she was Acid Burn, the hacker. 1995 film Hackers. She starred in it, and I saw that movie, and I instantly realized that the things that I love doing, taking my computer apart, putting it back together, or trying to connect over the internet to web servers on the other side of the planet, just so I can find out what's, what's there, because of my curiosity, this was called being a hacker. And if Angelina Jolie can be a hacker, and she can be the hero of, of the story, then why not try that myself? And I set out on a path, it was more than 20 years ago, I set out on a path to become a hacker, just like Acid Burn, my hero. And I'm proud to say I think the you know, path worked, because I'll never forget the first day when I just copy-pasted a script that some other hacker wrote. I, I ran the code, I didn't even know what it was going to do, but I managed to bypass a very simple login page for, for some web page. Now today, you know, bypassing a username, password, login page, this is something kids can do. But for me, it was open sesame. It was a superpower. I realized I can almost do anything if I follow this path, the path of the hacker. Since then, I've done a few things, worked with a few small and big organizations. I worked with the Israeli Defense Force Department of Information Security. I worked with a few big and small Israeli technology companies. And what I've been trying to do for the past decade, working with these technology companies, is always bring that hacker mindset to the table, always think about the next challenge. In the past few years, I've also been a faculty member at Tel Aviv University as a research fellow at the Yuval Neiman Workshop for Science, Security, and Technology. I work with Singularity University as a security teaching fellow. You heard from Lian about Singularity University in California. And I'm also an industry analyst with GigaOM Research, which is a media company based in California. What I'm trying to do with all these forward-thinking organizations is look for that new technology that's right around the corner. As you heard today, we live in a time of extremely rapid change. We don't even know what the new technology that's going to change our life is going to look like. But I'd like to offer you a vision to the future. I'd like to offer you a perspective into how hackers view the future. And it starts with this. Not many of us are going to have secrets anymore. Do you have secrets today? No. Not, not a lot of them, right? Already in 2015, secret private information is becoming a thing of the past. You might have some secrets from your friends, maybe from your family, your co-workers, your colleagues. 
but you definitely don't have secrets from these companies. The web giants of today. Their business model is your information. And, you know, I'm sure you've heard this before, but let me give you a quick tip. If you're not paying for something, you are the product. Your information is the product. You are the business model for these companies. So the future of cybersecurity, the future of hacking, is not going to be about secrets anymore. It's not going to be about your information. Instead, it's going to be about connected devices. And devices that are all over the world, and even across the galaxy. I asked you earlier if any of you speak Klingon. I guess not. But does any of you speak the most popular language in the galaxy? Java? Three billion devices today speak Java. Devices all over the planet and outside of our planet. Even the NASA Mars Curiosity rover speaks Java. So the same type of vulnerable technologies, like Java for instance, is the thing that allows us to run robots on Mars and to tweet about it as well. It's the same kind of technologies that run our modern world. This is what cybersecurity is going to be about. It's not going to be about your secrets, it's going to be about these things. Things that we rely on for our everyday life. Our electric power generation system, GPS satellites, radio frequency controls. All of these different systems are what hackers are now looking at. In the past month alone, we've heard about uh, hacking attacks into cars. If you're lucky enough to drive a BMW vehicle, in the past month, BMW announced that 2 million vehicles by their make were vulnerable to remote hacking attacks. Attacks that would make it possible for someone to lock and unlock the vehicle, perhaps turn on the brakes, change the navigation signal. We've heard about the smart televisions in your living room listening to your conversations and sending those back. This is what the future is going to be about, these things. And I heard uh, a few speakers today mention drones, so I want to tell you that drones can be hacked just the same. This guy is called Sammy. Maybe you heard about him a few years ago. It was a pretty infamous Sammy worm. Anyone heard about this computer worm? Well, Sammy doesn't deal with computer worms anymore. What he hacks now are drones. And what he did was create a drone hacking drone. Now, I will explain. He took a very popular drone platform, in this case the quadcopter, I'm sure many of you have seen these quadcopters around. And he used popular um, Raspberry Pi microcomputer. Anyone here know the Raspberry Pi? You've heard about those? It's a microcomputer. You can use it for a bunch of things. And he just combined an existing technology, a microcomputer, with an existing wireless cracking software called AirCrack. And he put those two things together on a new platform, a drone in this case. And now his drone can go up in the sky and hack into all the other drones in the neighborhood. And just like the Piper from Hemlin convinced those other drones to follow that drone around. Now, this is a bigger drone. This is a drone that the University of uh, Texas and Austin students decided to try and crash. And all they had to do in order to crash this drone, which is about a $500 or $1,000 piece of fiberglass, in order to crash it, all they had to do was send a spoofed GPS signal, telling the drone that it's located somewhere else than where it thought it was going to be. Pretty simple, I think you'll agree, but their next target was to use the same technique on something a little bigger. In this case, an $80 million super yacht. And the same technique worked. What I like about this story is that, that using technology that cost them about $500, they managed to crash a $1,000 piece of fiberglass and an $80 million piece of fiberglass without the same ease of access. In this case, they didn't crash the app, but they did manage to subvert its course and trick its human captain into changing course to another direction, all using a spoof GPS signal. But, you know, cars, televisions, even drones, that might be scary, but not as scary as hacking into the human body. And this is the current frontier that hackers are looking at. This is an embedded insulin pump. If any of you has diabetes, or know somebody who is a diabetic patient, you must know that devices like this, embedded insulin pumps, 
have been saving the lives of hundreds of thousands of diabetic patients around the world. They continuously measure the blood sugar levels and transmit insulin into the bloodstream as needed. And just like any other connected technology, it can be hacked. This is what this hacker did. His name is Barnaby Jack. And his goal was to try and demonstrate how using a radio frequency antenna in a simple computer, just like this computer, he can send signals to an embedded insulin pump and instruct the pump to dump any remaining insulin into the patient's bloodstream. Even a few units of insulin too much can be lethal. Dozens of them could kill a horse. This is a very scary demonstration, but Barnaby Jack didn't stop there. His next target was embedded pacemakers. Again, devices that have been saving the lives of hundreds of thousands of people around the world. And once again, Barnaby Jack wanted to use a radio antenna to send a signal to one of these devices, a signal that would send an electric shock through the body of the person wearing it. If this sounds like a plot of a TV show or something, right? But it's a very real threat. In fact, in 2007, when the former Vice President of the United States, Mr. Dick Cheney, got a new pacemaker installed, his security team made sure that they were going to disable any remote radio signal capability in this device to prevent a remote assassination threat on the Vice President. That was in 2007. However, only after Barnaby Jack's demonstration in 2012 did the United States government actually start making the device manufacturers check for this sort of threat. Now, if you're creating a new medical technology in the United States, the FDA is going to require a cybersecurity and hacker's point of view to be conducted, a test to be conducted on the same technology. When I heard about what Barnaby Jack did, I was scared, but I was also inspired. Barnaby Jack said that sometimes hackers have to demonstrate the threat in order to spark the solution, to move the governments and the medical device companies to create a better alternative in the world. And I agree. Hackers are always going to find those vulnerabilities, those bugs. As we create new and new technologies and we move them faster and faster into the market, there's going to be less and less time to test for these security problems. <coughs> but using hackers, companies around the world, companies like Google, Yahoo, Samsung, AT&T, have all started programs called bug bounty programs to work with the hacker community and identify problems in their products. This sort of thing makes me think about hackers as elements in a vast immune system for the technology age. In fact, that's the message I shared from my TED Talk, and I invite you to watch it. It was also uh, selected to one of the most influential TED Talks of 2014, but that's not why I'm here today. The reason I'm here today is to try and give you a different perspective on the hackers' world. So here is the bottom line. Hackers are not just the bad guys. They also find new ways to use technology. They are innovative, they create new technologies, and the choice of whether they're going to do something good, do something bad. It's not just in their hands. It is also in your hands, as companies, as consumers, as organizations, as private people. It's about how you choose to view the hackers in your world. Do you choose to work with them, to learn from them, or to make them the enemy? The choice is yours. Thank you.